All right. Um, I'm privileged to be sharing with my lovely wife, Nikki, and we are keen just to share some of our journey about church planting. We are six months in to our weekly meetings, and we are a, a little bit over 12 months since we started meeting as a, a, as a core team. And so we've learned some things, and we're le- still learning a whole heap of other things. We started with nine adults um, in our core team, and... Um, yeah, and last Sunday, I think we probably had around 90 men, women and children that shared a meal after the service, and we've got um, probably about 40% of our church would be children and about 60% adults, and a number of people part of our church that if it wasn't for our church plant, um, there would be dozens of people, if it wasn't for our church plant, they would be going nowhere, yeah. either they were people of no faith or people that had lost their way and were looking for a fresh start. So we're really thankful for what God's doing, but... Alas, like even in this service today, you're getting texts about things that need to be organized for tomorrow and things that we're still a baby church. And um, we just want to say thank you to all of you for what you've given to allow us to plant this church, Um, particularly the local church here at Seton, but all of our family centered churches. Uh, We don't take it lightly and it is great. You know, there's a lot of competitiveness in the kingdom of God between churches. So to be part of a cooperative family that is cheering each other on and giving to each other, sometimes at the cost of, y- of yourselves, is a great message. And people from other denominations that I talk to, they are blown away yeah. by our family. And so I just want to thank you. Can you all pat yourselves on the back? And um, just, we really just want to honour you and thank yeah. you. And that's part of the reason why, as Pastor Bill said, we have a heart to be a generous church. Mm. How can we not? Because of what God's done in us. How can we not want to be a church that plants churches when we are birthed out of the generosity of this fantastic church and other churches? So, um, yeah, thank you very much. So, Nikki and I were talking the other day about just how do you know if you should plant a church? And some of you have asked this question and some of you haven't. And I was sharing about three words that, I, well, a couple of things. That, and I said, Nikki, it's all about calling and it's all about the right people. And then she very wisely said, no, but it's also about the timing, um, which I think is very important too. So I just want to talk about this. How do you know individually or as a local church if you should plant a church? Um, So Nikki, just around calling, why is calling so important and what's our journey in calling? Well, I think that first of all, we just have to acknowledge and I think that the theme throughout the last few days has been that it's God's will to plant churches, world missions. It's God's will for all of our churches to be planting churches. Um, so that's in line with the calling over all of us. Um, but I guess there's specific individual callings where um, there are some people that God's calling to go and begin a work and others where God's calling them to uh, stay planted and be great supporters of of, of, of the work. So, um Yes, so that's sort of just acknowledging acknowledging that I think we're all part of that calling. It's not just an individual thing. Um, and, yeah, speaking on what Tim was just sharing, we've very much felt like we're not doing this alone at all. It's been extraordinary um, because we know, um, you know, we've been able to plant a church with the wind in our sails immediately um, because we've had such an immense amount of support. And it's not just financial at all. I mean, it's been, it's been amazing to have um, a budget to be able to plant the church because it costs money but it's not just about money it's like we've had so much support in prayer we've had support in people um, uh, sharing their gifts coming up um, and supporting us particularly in our kids ministry where we've just been from day one totally overwhelmed with the need there Um, but yeah it's it's so it's so important um, to for us, it's been so important for us. I don't think we would be anywhere near where we are without um, being sent with the foundation that we have, and still continually, we're drawing upon um, the generosity of of the church. So, um, yeah, it's been huge. Um, so, what was the question? Calling. Calling. Yeah. So I think for us, yeah, yeah. Um, for us specifically, before we were even dating. We had a conversation where Tim shared about just a dream that he had. I think we would have been 19 or 18. Um, He just had this dream for this church and leading a church. And he started describing it. And I just remember my heart leaping at it. And I was like, I I feel like that's the same dream that God's got in my heart. 
But when you're young, you kind of don't really know what that's going to look like. So we always thought, and had the back of our mind that God might use us to plant a church one day. But then um, for a number of years, it's just been a process of just going, okay, well, we're available to you, God, and use us with what you want us to do. And so probably we got to a point where we thought, well, maybe the actual pioneering a church wasn't going to be us. And actual fact, we were really happy and really planted here at Seton and did not expect for God to actually call us out. Um, so uh, we were just happy to be, yep, okay, well, we just support, we, we would just um, be, be um, faithful in what God's got before us um, and be planted um, until we're planted elsewhere, if that's if that's the thing. But truly, it really, really wasn't on the cards for a good while there. Um, and often I think God speaks, I think I see it in everyone's lives. I mean, we've all been there where God usually does a really big work in you personally before then he reveals what's the next step. And I know for me personally, um, there was, um, some of you know our family circumstances, but we've gone through some really difficult things um, with just raising our small children. And um, not only was that difficult, but God did a huge work in my own personal life. Um, and I know that timing is everything because he, I didn't know what was ahead, but if it hadn't been through for those number of years where um, God had to really, really do some heart surgery on me, um, that has now made sense and it's fortified me personally and our marriage and um, prepared us for the season that we're now in. Um, so uh, it was painful at the time and it was long, but I'm so grateful for it because I can now so quickly see, oh, that was God's hand all over it. He was preparing us for something so much bigger. Um, so the cooling's been there, but I guess just uh, um, I think we just have to be open to what you know, God has before us because timing is everything. But then very specifically, God spoke to both Tim and I on the first Sunday of 2017, last year, no, the year before last. Um, yeah, the first Sunday I walked in here at the 10.30 service. Tim had been there here earlier for the 8.30 service and I just nudged him and I said, babe, I feel like God just spoke to me. And sometimes I do that. And Tim just rolls his eyes because he's like, God's always speaking to you about something and it's usually not God. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, but I nudged him and I was just like, I really feel like God just impressed from my heart that this is your final year here at Seton. And it was quite shocking um, because it wasn't, again, wasn't the plan and we were very happy here. Um, and then I was shocked when Tim said to me, I felt the same thing when I walked in earlier today. And so at this stage, obviously, no one knew about it. And we were just like, oh, wow, this is huge. What are we going to do? And, um, and then over a period of um, weeks and a couple of months, very short period, um, God confirmed it in a number of different ways. So in the end, it was just the push that we needed. We just knew, yep, yeah, okay, God's, God's saying we need to start something. We don't quite know where. It wasn't like go south or whatever. Um, but we knew that this season was coming to an end. Um, and, uh, yeah, very quickly, you know, Knowing that God's spoken, even though we didn't know what it was going to look like, it was actually really exciting <laughs> because you're like, wow, this is real. And then there's so many confirmations all the way through. I mean, even particularly when we first spoke to Dad about it, how he responded was a huge confirmation to see his heart for the kingdom, not just for the local, like for um, his own congregation here. So, yeah. And the calling is, is vital and the timing for us as a family, I think like Nikki said, um, just even 18 months earlier, it was off, what was off the cards became on the cards really quickly. And I just want to say that to everyone here, there are yeah. things that are, are a, not a no in your life. It's just a wait. Yeah. It's just a wait. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so if God has spoken to you, it's not a, and, and it hasn't happened, it's not a no, it's a wait. Yeah. And, um, and so I think calling is important. God did call us a long time ago, and then he called us in a more an, an urgent sense mm -hmm. and, and gave us this burning desire that now is the time. But then I think the people, like Nikki said, I think the geography of where we're planning the church, it was already obvious because God had prepared. God was already at work. Mm. God already had the Paisalak family's position uh, in Ronella. He already had the Molinar family in Ronella. He already had the Van Heerdens in Shido Park that were all part of this local church with a heart and, and very quickly all said, we want to be part of this. And so it wasn't like, let's speculate as to what God's doing. It was almost like a God's already at work. Let's be part of what he's doing. And so essentially where we're meeting now, and, and we've got another family, fantastic family from this church, 
that, it, that has shifted down into the Hort Acres there at Sea Cliff. And so if you draw a circle around where our core families lived, that's essentially where we're meeting now. And so God was at work and it was just about the timing to wake us up to what he was doing. And I think sometimes that's how God speaks. He, he opens our eyes to what he's, he's already doing. And so even with this, what Bill's talking about in Greece, it's not about, well, Greece is a good idea. No, no, actually God's at work. Yeah. And our job is to interpret what he's doing. Um, I think one of our greatest fears in stepping out, um, you know, having one child on the autism spectrum, another child that um, at times is um, just, well, at that time was un unmanageable um, in terms of behaviour, um, we were really worried about what planning a church would do to our kids, yeah. taking them out of a stable environment. Tell, tell us, Nikki, just about how it's been for our kids and our family planning yeah, a church. I mean, I think... It's been probably one of the great mercies um, in this in this thing is that seeing that God has brought special people into their life in the kids' ministry. Um, the Even though the kids' team is really, really stretched, um, there's such a genuine love for my kids and I see that they look out for them big time. Um, and, you know, um, I mean, there's a large kids' ministry here at Seton, um, but it just happened to be that our daughter Amari only had one other girl her age all the way through. And just randomly down south, she's got six girls the exact same age as her. And so she's just sort of got this little gaggle of friends, which has just been amazing. And it just I feel like that's just a little bit of a mercy there just to help her along the way. But what's been great is also seeing... Um, They've actually had to see us step out. So I was even, um, I was in the car with Amari on Sunday and I didn't realise I said it in front of her. I was like, oh, I'm so tired and I'm driving to church and I'm like, I'm so tired. We had a big weekend and other stuff going on and and Ma Amari's like, Mum, I'm so tired too. And I said, yeah. And then I realised, oh, I've got an audience here. She's seeing, seeing this. And so um, I was just like, you know what? We're going to have a great Sunday. It's going to be great. And, you know, we're going to get there and we're going to, you know, as soon as we see people, God's going to give us energy. Um, and, you know, let's just pray that God will give us the energy to, to like, have an awesome Sunday. And it was a great Sunday. And I just just realised that it, um, there's been so many opportunities where the kids are just watching um, the faith in action. And I know that it's having a really positive effect on them. Um, and there's been things that haven't been comfortable for sure. Um, and there's a lot of bribes like McDonald's after church and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you do what you have to do. But um, we, we learned that from Brian Houston. <laughs> yeah. He said, if you, if you want your kids to love church, yeah. take them to Macca's take them to after Macca's church. After. I'm like, I received yeah. that word. But certainly a, big, uh, certainly a huge thing. And I think that's a learning thing um, growing up in a ministry family. But also, you know, we've been in ministry for a long time now, um, making sure that we... Um, leave the baggage not inside the house, that we leave it before we get into the house. And we're really careful about the way that we speak, especially when we're processing big emotions, because you've got to talk. And the Tim and I are, you know, having to process a lot and chat about things, but we're being super careful and hopefully we'll continue to be really careful about the way we speak, because I know that the kids hear it all. Um, and I know what it was like growing up in the church. And um, if I'm speak, preaching to the choir, I apologise. Um, but I know what it's like when you hear things and you're processing it as a child about other adults. You actually don't hear the real truth. And so what you think, you actually take on hurts and um, disappointments on behalf of your parents because you might hear something, um, but you don't know the whole story. And um, that can be quite damaging. So I just want to encourage you in anything that you do, just be, be aware of the audience that's watching you. So, I mean, the bottom line is, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then your needs will be given to you. Not your wants, but your needs. And I think the flourishing of my children is a need yeah. that I have. Um, and, and God has been faithful that my kids are okay. Yeah. They're doing better than what they were a year ago, and I give him thanks. I think Nikki and I argue less about church now than when before. This is a radical idea. Um, we used to argue a lot, and we still argue. I mean, I married a Greek woman, and I have had to meet fire with fire. Um, you know, and some of you in this room that have married fiery women know <laughs> what it's it. like. And some of you have married fiery, fiery men, and you know what it's like. You have to contest for the things that are important in your relationship, and sometimes it's not all easy. Mm. Is that true? And, and so we, we have some fiery conversations, but, but I think the thing about planning a church is we are united in the mission that God's given us and we are serving together and so while there might be challenges we are a, 
we're a team. And that is a blessing. And so, um, so, so I think actually for us in many ways that, that if you've been serving in ministry for a long time, God is preparing you for new challenges. Mm. And when you go through the new challenges, you might realize that you have a resilience through what God has taken you, that you can actually do things and think, wow, I thought this would be nearly impossible, yeah. but he's equipped me. He's equipped me. And actually, if you've been serving for longer than five years, you have more experience than Jesus' disciples. Mm. You, you actually have, you have runs on the board and God has given you the ability to do things that you don't even know, you, in some of us. And so planning a church, like, yeah, it's really hard, but ministry is hard. And, and it's not like this radical, do you know what? It's all Jesus' church. The local church is where it's at. And so whether it's a new church, and all, it's all, all different problems, but it's all hard. And we all need the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And God will attack our marriages, whether we're in a church plant or not. So, um, so don't allow fear for family to distract you from saying yes to a new opportunity in pioneering church planning, pioneering a new ministry, pioneering an outreach, going on a mission trip, anything like that. Um, so what have been some uh, challenges in the last 12 months or some areas where you feel like um, you've been tested? Um, well, I think, um, I think the greatest challenge or um thing that i felt i really felt the weight of stepping into is um taking hold of um the spiritual authority that goes with leading in a church um the only way that i can describe it is it was it's a similar feeling to what it was like becoming a mum um when when i became a mum naturally you know you think of a mum you're a nurturer and you know you're going to nurture this child but it wasn't until um, a couple of weeks into motherhood that I was out with Amari and something happened where a stranger touched her um, face and I just instinctively immediately felt this like tiger mum come out. <laughs> sort of almost this ferociousness and I had to hold myself back from overreacting big time because someone touched my baby, although they shouldn't have. Um, nonetheless, I was really quite shocked by this kind of... Um, yeah, not meekness, like a real kind of no uh, fierceness and protective thing that just came over me. And you realise, in as if you've got a child, you know that you know that instinctively, it's quite a miraculous thing that happens. It's just, you know, um, you 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 want to cover them, you want to protect them and nurture them in in everything. And so I feel a little bit like that with planning the church um, with Tim, uh, and this sort of beyond role because to be honest. I didn't really have any expectations of what my role would be because I'd just really come out of quite a long season of being so hands-on with the kids and not really being able to serve in any very significant capacity in the church. Um, so I was just like, okay, I'm just going to be managing the kids and hope that they're doing okay. But surprisingly, they've been doing really well and it's meant that I've been able to step in way more than I anticipated. But what that's meant is there's been a big stretch on me. <laughs> um, and um, But certainly... Um, the spiritual authority thing has been something that's yeah shocked me a little bit, um, although it shouldn't, but it has in practical in the practical where, you know, you're in a room, and there's lots of interesting people in the room, and things are said. Um, people come into churches, particularly they're very attracted to church plants because I think they think they can shape the church plant, and they have their own opinions, and they've got some really interesting theology, and um, how to not just sense what's going on, but then how to respond um, and take authority, but also do it in a loving way. And I found that to be probably the most significant challenge. Um, and it's that balance of control versus also allowing people to be themselves and taking them on a journey. Because if you argue with somebody, it's not going to help them to grow and see differently so just trying to figure that out and be conscious that God's at work and he's actually needing me to step up in all of those um, situations which to be honest happens every time we gather together in any capacity in the church. So yeah so I think that's how culture develops with parents and kids is you you give guidance but you also give flexibilities for kids to grow and to mature and to to take steps on their own and I think one of the things I've noticed we've got people from 
um, from conservative backgrounds, from swinging by the chandelier, Pentecostal churches, to people that are just spiritual and not religious, and people that are agnostic. And so everyone has different opinions. And I think the thing that I've realized that gets tested the most in a church planning context is not the vision of the church, because everyone is excited about loving God and loving people. It's like, that's not controversial, but I think it's your values that are tested. And it's the culture that's tested. And so it's the things that you will and won't do. And so it might be um, just people that are coming and saying, well, why are we doing this? Or comparing to another church. And it's like, actually, your values are tested. So for us, it's like the, even the value of us having a full kids program from week one, like that costs our church. But we have a value of treating um, single mums that bring their kids along to church with dignity so that when they come to church, they can fully participate in the worship of Jesus Christ and hear the preaching of the word without feeling like they're they're looking after their kid all the time because they've made a massive effort to come to church. It's a value of ours. It's a value of ours that we want children not just... um, city learning but actually learning what it means to worship and so we're trying to teach our kids church how to have worship they have worship last week I mean my daughter's playing keyboard and um, Dan's uh, kids are involved in the worship and Tommy's learning ukulele ukulele already and ukulele that's a new word um ekulele um glockulele um glossolele um and, and, and so I think even things like excellence, like, um, you know, some churches have a value of, oh, our children's ministry is the kids just play with crayons on the floor under the chair. It's like, that's fine. But we actually want to have a kids ministry of excellence where we give our very best because kids are not peripheral to the mission of the church, but they're central to the mission of the church. And so your values are tested. The way you talk about other churches, the way you talk about people in the church that you have disagreements with, the way you have issues with that person that's really distracting on a Sunday, the way you talk about them, it tests your values. And people who come from other churches might not hold the same values. So that's where I think it's, um, it's great. And it's great that in our core team, we have, um, fam- we have families from, uh, from Seton Christian Family Centre. We've got a couple of families from the Hills Christian Family Centre. And the Christian Family Centre values are strong, but they're unique. So I think that's been really uh, encouraging. Um, Nikki... Do you want to tell us how we've got word out about our local church to the people in the south of Adelaide? Yeah, someone just said to me the other day when I invited her to church, nope, you can't market me. <laughs> I was like, I'm not in marketing you, I'm just inviting you. <laughs> anyway, it was maybe you just had to be there, it was kind of funny. Um, but um, yeah, so essentially, um, yeah, it's a really funny one how you get word out because it's a whole new world. Um, and the reality is the front door of your church is your online presence. Um, If you think about where you go, anywhere, if you haven't been there before or you're not going with someone, you're most likely going to check it out online. You're going to figure out exactly where it is. You're going to do your Google Maps and you're probably going to read about it, you know, like a show or even a movie. I mean, I can't even go to a movie without him IMDBing it and finding everything about it. I'm like, can't you just live on the edge? Can't you just like... (laughs) No, it could be a flop, but, you know. So, So I think, like, just it's not... It's not a question, it's a reality. Your front door of the church is your online presence. Website, Facebook in particular, and, um, and Instagram um, as well. Um, it seems to be that Facebook is the way that most people engage. Websites are for like the kind of people who like to do their research. So people who are really interested are going to get on a website and read all about your vision and values. But 98% of those people are going to be people that check out your Facebook page. So Facebook's really important. And um, so um, we have um, very deliberately um, made an online presence and it's really tricky to figure out how to present who we are without coming across as completely pretentious um, or trying to oversell and be not who we are. And, and um, that's, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey with that because, I mean, Tim in particular hates being on camera and hates anything on social media. So anything that you see of him on social media is me going, baby, really need to do this, babe. I'm like, we're going to do a video or whatever because the truth is people love video. And um, so we've deliberately done quite a lot of videos because we've just noticed that the engagement um, and you can actually track... Like four times higher oh, than a still image? No, least. so I think it's something like 12 times right. higher if you do a video as opposed to a still image um, as far as real close engagement, yeah. particularly sharing and that kind of thing. So um, we just see it as, look, it's the front door. It's not 
presenting something that we're not, but it's just saying, I know that it's a little bit like the, what used to be putting a flyer out um, and sending them out on a letterbox drop. The chances of somebody getting that flyer and going, oh, wow, I'm going to go visit that church, is pretty low. But what that does is it gives people a face and they go, oh, I've, I've heard about that church. And then they have another interaction where they hear about the church again. And then it sort of adds to all of this, oh, okay, maybe the universe is telling me I need to go to church or whatever. So and, um, and We have people in our church today that yeah. the, the way they found out about a church is through social yeah. media. So it's... Yeah. It's a small piece of the puzzle. It's it's a tiny piece of the puzzle. I'm not social media is not going to if you if you're like our social media is really terrible. Don't worry. To be honest, just you can improve that. But it's not it's not the be all and end all because people need personal connection and people come to church because they're invited by another person. It's simply that um, the majority of people that have come um, so far into our church have been 98 percent. Um, invited people and so whilst we've deliberately done an online presence we've done nothing else as far as marketing um, other than our focus and our language and the the message every week is guys this is about your everyday life this is about um, having conversations about God and inviting them into your world um, and also bringing them along to church or a gathering or whatever's going on so um, we yeah fully embrace the online reality but fully embrace the fact that it's actually about personal connection that's more powerful than anything and I think also one of the things we've tried to do is every event we run to be purposeful so whether it's a gathering last year at Easter time we just want to make sure we, we can any church can run men's events women's events you know kids but whatever we're doing we have to be able to really clearly articulate this is why we're doing it this is why we can't not do it and communicate that to the people um, as, as an opportunity just for building connections. And I think that's been relatively um, successful. Um, talk about some of the limitations, because I think we've all got limitations in our churches, but in our context, we've our, even our location gives us limitations. And how have we... Um, actually, I might just uh, start to that. I think for us, we, our only venue that we... That our first venue that we had available, which is where we are now, it meant that we could only meet in the afternoons, which for me, like, I'm old school. I would like to meet in the morning, and get church out of the way so I can have an afternoon nap Sunday afternoon. Like, that is just my will be done, not God's will be done. Um, but God had other plans for us. And we have uh, a couple of families in the church that I know would not come have come to our church if we didn't meet in the afternoon. There's one lady that's in a wheelchair, and she just said, I can't do church in the morning because it's too hard. She comes to church with her two little boys, and it's a massive effort to come to church, and she needs that extra time so she can come in her wheelchair to church um, and, and it's like, well, thank you, God, that we could meet that woman's need. And she's now fully connected part of our church family. And, um, and so we have limitations. And I think uh, the Craig Rochelle phrase is we need to learn to not just think outside the box and be big and creative and out there, but think within, inside the box. Think yeah. within the limitations we have and say there's opportunities within limitations yeah. because it causes us to, okay, there's some things we can't do right now and that's okay. But let's look at what we can do yeah. within our limitations. I mean, one of the limitations with um, being forced to do an afternoon service um, and when you've got 40 very small children coming is they go crazy on a Sunday afternoon. They're hangry. That means angry, hungry. Um, and so we've had to, from the beginning, we have to feed them in the service. Um, and so that's, part, you know, so feeding the kids is also a significant thing. Um and, yeah, just figuring out ways to make it work um, so that hopefully families aren't going home completely wrecked after church. We have, we have kids come to our kids' ministry from, and that, like, they might have gone to, to Edge or Seeds, the, big, the biggest churches in the south of Adelaide, and they're like, we love this kids' ministry, it's amazing. They gave us a sandwich. <laughs> it's true. And it's amazing, like, there's a whole range of areas where we can't compete, but in our, but in our church, there's things that we can do better than anyone or different to anyone. Yes, yeah, different. And, um, and so it's provided opportunities for us and with our limitations. Um, you know, in our, we've got, you know, a very, very small band, but we have an acoustic feel and we have a fantastic, um, we have fantastic worship. We don't have a full band, but we work within our limitations. Um, yeah, and I think my encouragement to you is that, that, that it's okay that you can't do everything right now. Maybe God doesn't want you to do everything right now, but what you can do, do with excellence, and God will use it. Um, I, 
I just want to say, I think it's been an absolute joy to have so much support and encouragement from uh, being, in being sent out, but we have not been controlled in any way. Yeah. And so we are free to outwork the mission that God's given us. Um, it, it's like when I talk to people from other denominations or other movements, it's like, how good is it in our system that we have Norm Reed in Hobart and we have uh, Rebecca and Ben in Alice Springs and all of our churches have this incredible freedom to, um, to outwork God's mission in accordance with the values that he's given us and we have support and encouragement and there's checks and balances. But I just think, isn't it great that we have so much freedom yeah. that, that we don't have people telling us no all the time, yeah. but we have godly checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And I just think if ever there was an environment that was conducive to us planting more churches, yeah. the CFC churches. This is an environment where we've got to be careful saying God's no for him. Yeah. Because I think he's given us a platform and a foundation to say, yes, if God has given you a vision and if you've got people and if the timing's right, you need to say yes because there is support and there is encouragement. And I'm with us in the early days um, when we started, we had, you know, a handful of people coming down to help us with our kids ministry from Seton but you know what even if you want to plant in a remote area there will be support like I'm so thankful it's been hard work but I'm so thankful that um, Estera and Tom uh, Daly have just moved up to Alice Springs and it's like it's hard work because a lot of couples have been tapped on the shoulder over the years to move up to Alice Springs but do you know what we we are a family we do care about each other I was telling Rebecca before we pray out where a new church plant in our prayer meetings, we pray for you guys. We pray for your property. We pray for your youth ministry. And it's like, do you know, no, most churches don't have this. I'm talking to the local um, Baptist pastor where we meet, and it's like, mate, they have arguments and power struggles within their own church. And here we are. We have a family cheering each other on. We have an amazing platform to plant churches. Um. Is there anything else? Like you, you've kind of covered some of the other things. Yeah. I think we should finish, maybe finish with some prayer. Is yeah. there something else you wanted to share just about maybe what we've learned in the last? Well, um, no, I just wanted maybe just adding to what Tim was just saying um, is that personally, if you'd asked, I was kind of bracing myself that this journey was going to be really hard. And look, we're right at the beginning of the journey. So I know there's probably going to be some really difficult things ahead. I'm not um, immune to that. But um, I expected it would be much harder than it's been. Um, not to say it's not terribly um, challenging at times, but um, there's just something about um, flowing with what God um, has and also having conviction that it's what God's called you to do because I think you can do anything. Um, and God also gives you the capacity to manage it and not just bear it and go, okay, I'm just bearing it, but actually thrive in it. And so I just am so conscious of anyone in the room. Um, I, I, I know there's people who are leading churches in the room um, and I trust that through the conversations over the last two days that maybe there's just been a spark that's gone, yeah, let's believe for our church to actually um, give birth. Um, and I do want to say that like Tim said at the beginning, because of the faith of some of the people that have stepped out of the boat, they were serving, some were serving, some were not even here at Seton, some weren't even attending regularly. They've come and stepped out of the boat and it's not just us, but them. And they, God is using them and growing them as well. So it's actually been an opportunity for a whole another group of people to step into a calling that God has for them that in a bigger church, um, in that they may have just sort of sat back a little bit. And um, so in your churches, trust that actually there's going to be people that may not be people that you would imagine would be running whole ministries, but given that opportunity, they might step up. So um, so just like hopefully that's inspiring because we've seen that. We're like there's people that are part of our church that were like once every six weekers here at Seton that are now like there for the whole day every week. <laughs> Um, serving and not only serving but growing and I think that sometimes that experience of doing something in a small and small environment is it's great for people's faith um, so so there's that um, and then also for anyone in the room if you're feeling like there's you know as soon as church planning spoken about you just feel that tug on your heart then that's the Lord so just trust the timing God will make it really clear 
Um, I do believe that he plants you in places, he plants you sometimes and you need to, to grow <laughs> um, and that I don't recommend church planting if you're not um, coming from a place of being whole. <laughs> you need to be strong <laughs> emotionally and spiritually. Um, if you're bleeding all over the place, it's not a good idea to plant a church um, but right now. But just let God do that work in your life and then you see what door he's going to open up for you. So I just want to encourage you that if that tugs on your heart, take hold of it and trust God with the timing. Can I also just say the future, like the, ch- the influence of the church in our country is diminishing more and more. The future is not going to be solved with one service on a Sunday morning particularly. So we have to be more courageous with our innovation not just innovation for innovation's sake, but the previous models are not. So, so the, the idea that we have to build a big auditorium to get everyone in on a Sunday morning, I don't know many people that are doing that anymore. Because let me tell you, you can be a, ch- a small church and God might still want you to innovate and start a Friday night gathering. Because there's people in your church that cannot come on a Sunday morning and we need to be courageous enough to say yes. Like we're, we're um, in faith, we're talking about you know, if we are able to move to a new venue to start Sunday morning, I, I want to do Sunday nights straight away because I, how dare I say no to that woman on the, in the wheelchair? How dare I say this is not a church for you? I will not do that. And the other thing is I've talked to our young adults and they hate Sunday mornings. And, the te- and, we've, and we've, we, we had hardly any young adults and we started an alpha group and we're trying to reach these young adults and I'm like, oh no, we're going to become a, a Sunday morning family church and when you guys are still sleeping in and all your friends are sleeping off their hangovers. Are we really serious about reaching their friends? And, and um, I was talking to Don Redden from the City Light Church. They have um, probably about 40% more people in small groups than they have on Sunday gatherings. And a lot of those people are young adults. The, the way to build family and to build connection and relationship moving forward, we have to be open to new models of, the, you know, the, the same gospel, but new models to reach more people. And I don't think it's going to be getting everyone together on a Sunday morning as much as I love that, as much as I love that. And I'm, you know, just talking to Ben and Rebecca, it's like, man, you could have a building of 150 people and do repeat services and be the largest church in Alice Springs. It's like we need to start stop thinking about um, why we can't do stuff and why we can do stuff. Because like even Dan and I, like we probably, there wouldn't be a week or two weeks that go past where we don't talk about church planting. And it's just like, you know, Ian talked about daydreaming. Half of it's just daydreaming. It's just like, whoa, what if we did this or what if we did that? But you know what? Every now and again, a what if or why not, you find stuff, oh, well, maybe God could do this. Or maybe this venue, maybe God could be in this venue, or maybe actually God's drawing people from here, maybe that could be a future church plant. So if you actually look for it and you say, God, I, I, I want to be part of planting churches, I think God will start showing you opportunities. We've got a family that's um, from Ordinga, and I was talking to them about starting a home group, and I said, hey, yeah, if you start a home group, that's great, and if it gets big enough, it can, we can turn it into an outreach, because I'm sowing seeds that this is not just about playing church, this is about reaching communities for Christ. And so I'm trying to sow those seeds to the church, because who knows where our next church plant will be. If, you, if God's spoken to you, let us know. And we're not trying to be presumptuous, we're just trying to be about the New Testament pattern. The Lord added to the number daily those that were being saved and um and non-christians are not going to commute half an hour to your church so let's go to where the people are and let's believe that god wants all of our churches to reproduce amen can we just stand to our feet and if god has spoken to you maybe about church planning and this could be about supporting someone or it could be about going can we can you just if God has been stirring something in your heart it might be an idea it might be pioneering a new service or pioneering a new congregation because one of our values as the Christian Family Centre Church is proactivity and the, the word I like to use is pioneering pioneering is in our blood if God has been stirring you about pioneering it might be a long-term thing or a short-term thing just put your hand up now and I just want to pray for you put your hand up right now if God has been stirring you Thank you, Lord. If God's been stirring you about pioneering, put your hand up. And if someone's got their hand up, can we just gather around those with their hands up and just let's just lay hands on. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you so much that you are rising up 
a heart for pioneering, a, a heart for risky faith in the Christian Family Centre churches. And oh Lord, we just join with what we heard from Pastor Jeremy in the previous session, that Lord, you are calling us to break new ground in the nations of the world. But we also know that you have brought the nations to Australia. You've brought the refugees to Australia and migrants to Australia and there are ethnic groups and there are families that have actually never heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord... Send us out, Lord, send us. And if you're not calling us to be sent, you're calling us to help others and equip others to be sent. Lord, I pray you give us a burning desire to not just be content with what is. Lord, may we be generous in the same way that we love because of you first loved us. We give because you've first given to us. We plant because you have planted a seed of faith in our hearts. And we thank you, Lord. We just believe by faith that all of the reasons and all of the excuses why no is the answer or wait is the answer. We just believe that if you have spoken, if you have called and if you are stirring us, you will speak a gentle yes at the right time. And when you speak the yes, you will provide the resources, you will provide the people and you will confirm the timing. So Lord, for these folks that are getting prayed for, I just pray for the call. I pray for the timing and I pray for the people. Lord, we just thank you that we do not do any of this by as a one-man band. We are called to do ministry in teams. And I pray, bring people alongside our churches with a heart for reaching into communities. Lord, I just pray for the communities of Hobart, the communities of Alice Springs, the communities of Adelaide, the, the regional centers. Lord, and we just say, God, where there are hungry and lonely people saying, we are craving an answer. Lord, I thank you that the answer is not just the gospel, it's the people of God um, living out the gospel as a community of faith. And I thank you that the primary vehicle by which the gospel is going to go into all the world is through the local church. And so you're not just calling for people to get saved, you're calling for people to be discipled. And I just thank you, Lord. And we just know that when we pray, God, send us out. God, give us a heart for communities. Give us a heart for nations. Give us a heart for planting churches, that we are praying in accordance with the will of the Father and that all of your promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, we've been said this before, but the greatest churches in the Christian Family Center family may not have even been planted yet. In a hundred years time, we want to look back and we say, God, to you be your glory, honor and praise for what you have done in raising up great churches that will continue and perpetuate until Jesus returns. So, Lord, we pray for all these folks. And, Lord, we also just pray. I just want to really pray, Lord, that this is part of the DNA of our churches, world missions and church planning, that they actually go hand in hand, that there's actually a, that there's a, a momentum that you're sending us out. Lord, I pray for our churches where there's people that are comfortable, that we don't get angry at them for being comfortable, but we're able to inspire them that there is a better way. And Lord, that we're able, those of us in this room that are leaders, that we can lead by example. Lord, I just, um, I just feel, just as we close, I just feel to pray for this local church, the, the church of Seton. Lord, we just thank, thank you for this local church at Seton that has given disproportionately to others, Lord. And we just thank you in the same way that this local church has sacrificed in sending missionaries and church planters out Around the world, Lord, I pray that there is a new richness. There's a new, almost like um, an irrigation system that has been plugged in. And so where the grass, even like sp spiritually, the grass out here was dying and it got an irrigation system that was connected to those water tanks. I pray for a new season of irrigation in this church, that there's a richness and there's a flourishing of life and that there's a growth in this local church. There's a growth in the financial giving. There's a growth in the, the people you're bringing into the church and Lord it's not just a growth to give out but it's a growth to reach many many hundreds of men women and children Lord I just pray for the leaders in this local church that they will be refreshed and that Lord that there will be a season of reaping a harvest Lord not just sowing but of reaping Lord I pray Lord I thank you that you are repositioning the western suburbs of Adelaide Lord and you are changing the demographics of this area but Lord I believe even as new people move into housing developments and apartments down the road 
don't. Lord, may there be a season of reaping coming. Lord, send out workers because the harvest is ready. We believe that you are preparing the harvest of the western suburbs of Adelaide. And this church will not just be a western suburbs church, but this church will be a regional church for the whole city. And so, Lord, bless Pastor Bill, bless Pastor Cass, bless the whole team. Lord, all of the congregational pastors. Lord, we pray for the Friday morning congregation. We pray for the seniors. We pray for the children, that many, many young people will be one to the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for the new youth leaders, Rachel and Nick. Lord, I just pray that that, that a great revival takes place in the teenagers of the Christian Family Center. And it's almost like um, it's, it's a revival like the early days of the Christian Family Center. And that there is a new birth coming. And it's not just... Christians becoming more Christian it's becoming it's people coming from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and that there is a revival of young people in this church and it will bring new life and replenishment and blessing and that those young people will one day go out to the nations of the world so Lord we pray for these things we thank you and we just pray for all of our churches that we will be life-giving churches that we will be generous churches and that we will be church planting churches we pray all of these things in Jesus name Amen. Amen.